Welcome back to Beyond the Patterns. So today I have the great pleasure to introduce Roger David Soberanis Mukul. He is a PhD student at the Chair for Computer-Aided Medical Procedures and Augmented Reality at the Technical University of Munich. He studied his bachelor's in computer engineering and master's in computer science at the mathematics faculty of the Autonomous University of Yucatan, Mexico. His work focuses on deep convolutional and graph convolutional networks for medical applications with a particular interest in medical image segmentation. So today I have the great pleasure to announce his presentation entitled An Uncertainty-Based Graph Convolutional Network for Organ Segmentation Refinement. Roger, it's a great pleasure to have you here and the stage is yours. Thank you. Um, thanks a lot. Um, I will uh, start the presentation. Thanks a lot for, for the invitation. Uh, as I, as I um, was mentioned, I will present uh, our recent work on sequential refinement using a combination of uncertainty analysis over the outputs of a CNN and also combine it with some ideas uh, taken from the graph conversion networks. Uh, after after that, I will like to start uh, mentioning a little bit uh, um, about me. Uh, as was mentioned at the beginning, I came from the Chair of Computer Ethics and Medical Procedures when I am currently doing a PhD uh, in the Technical University of Munich, and this is a, a nice picture of the of the group camp, at least the group years ago, because uh, so far. For the moment, we are not allowed to, to have these meetings, but this is a picture from two or three years ago in one of the workshops that the chair organized. And as you can see, we are a numerous group. We, have, we are split basically in three different, four different uh, groups, focus uh, on augmented reality, focus on, um, on more inter interdisciplinary research between medical doctors and between computer scientists. Uh, we are. We have also a computer vision group, and finally, we have a medical image analysis group. With learning that this one one is the group um, where I belong. Um, some of the works of my interest in general are medical image segmentation. I like a, a lot working with. Um, with this particular topic, but also I am interested in deep learning for medical applications. And I have been, um, let's say, playing with CNNs and GCN architectures for refinement, and also the application of the uncertainty analysis of CNNs also for refinement, that is the topic of this talk. Apart from that, I also have um, working with localization problems, this is most related to the poly problem, to the poly detection problem. We have in the bottom some examples of, of image taken from the end of this um, poly detection chronoscopy, it's a challenge in Mikai 2015. And uh, we have some example of polyps in the image. Um, I have working with some localization region proposal networks for doing localization in this image and also in some semi-supervised uh, learning methods also for Poly detection problems. Um, for today, I would like to talk about the approach that we proposed for doing the refinement of the organ for the organ segmentation problem. This is a, a strategy for single organ segmentation, and this is a general overview that I would like to to show before going into details. Uh, at, the, at the top, we have all the components that we are using, uh, we are taking for the for doing the refinement. Uh, we have also, with all these components, the main idea is to formulate the problem as a graph learning problem. 
over the slices of the volume, of the input volume. And then use, uh, take some ideas from the graph convolution networks to obtain the final refined segmentation. This is a general overview. And now let's talk in detail about these parts of the methodology. Okay, so as I mentioned, uh, the main problem to address here is image segmentation. Uh, image segmentation, if someone is not familiar, aims to subdivide the image into two or more meaningful regions. Uh, for example, we have here um, different uh, input slice, and we can see different uh, the different organs highlighted. This is an example of um, let's say a multi-organ segmentation uh, in one particular slice. When we can see that we have each organ belonging to one single continuous region, there is no overlap between the different regions. And of course, we can also visualize this on, in 2D. Also, we can take a look, for example, of how the 3D representation of this looks like that will be the case of this image to the right here. The segmentation of anatomical structures in general is an important step in many other computed medical procedures. It could be, for example, be useful to reduce the region of interest so we can focus only on one particular region to, to work with. It can also be used to localize some anatomies inside the body. For example, in this case, we can say that this is for sure the liver and we can differentiate the pixels or the box cells that belong to the liver over the other. Uh, anatomies in the in the in the in, in the CT slice. Uh, also, we can use to maybe hide, highlight some anomalies inside the one particular tissue. For example, when we are trying to do a tumor localization, uh, we can also, for example, use segmentation algorithms to find to identify tumor in, inside one particular anatomy. And of course, uh, currently, as happened with many tasks, deep convolution networks are leading the state art in segmentation problems. We have here, for example, the, the unit proposed by Olaf. Uh, we have that this is a very popular architecture for medical image segmentation. It has this shaped uh, architecture with some initial and color steps. Um, one the color part with this uh, connection that concatenate the features at different resolutions. And currently, this kind of architectures have shown to be to have very nice and promising results in different segmentation tasks. However, even though the the nice performance of these networks, we can say that there is uh, still work to do. For example, for the organ segmentation problem, let's talk specifically, for example, the pancreas. And uh, we can have uh, interpatient variability between, in, in the, for example, the pancreas between different patients. Different patients might have some slight liberations in the shape of the pancreas, even though the global, the global shape could be similar. They are slightly different in, in the, let's say, in, in the shape between, the, between different patients. And also, there is a high similarity between organs and background. There is a, a lack of contrast between what could be considered background, what would be considered organ, and also, for example, when we, when we are working specifically, uh, we want to segment one particular organ, we can see, for example, that if we take a look at this picture, it might be complicated to, to differentiate between a different organ because maybe uh, the surrounding organs for the pancreas, for example, might look similar. Uh, the, the, the texture of the tissue might look similar for the target organ and for the surrounding organs. And this, of course, can lead to errors in the prediction of the segmentation. We, we have here one example. We have the input image. We have one prediction coming from a, uh, from a unit, in this case, from a two-dimensional unit. And when we compare this prediction with the ground truth, with the reference, we can see that uh, the network can segment as correctly a group. Of, of pixels, the green marks here, but also there is some elements that they are not 
in the referent that were wrongly classified as organ. In this case, the organ is the pancreas. Uh, those correspond to the red pixels indicated here. Uh, similarly, we can also have the other side of the of the coin. Let's say we can also have some have some some pixel that should should have been segmented by the network. For example, in, in this case here, but actually there is no. There were not uh, final. They were not correctly segmented by the prediction. In general, we can hear one example of one group of of false and negative, and one group indicated in white, and one group of false positive indicated in red. So in this regard, it will be um, beneficial to have some methodologies to try to correct, to try to refine as good as possible the output of the, of the conversion neural networks. And that's where the segmentation refinement methods come into the into the scene. Refinement methods in general aim to reduce the errors in the CNS segmentations. We need, or we are trying to reduce the number of false positive and false negative that we obtain during the segmentation process. And but also there is another uses of refinement. For example, we can choose refinement strategies uh, as an intermediate step in some supervised learning problems. For example, when we want to generate so the labels for unlabeled data, we can apply refinement methods to try to correct the errors in the pseudo label in order to generate a, a more precise as possible uh, so the label for the unlabeled input of the data, for example, in some supervised learning. And one of the, let's say one popular method for doing this refinement is conditional random field that is used as a post-processing approach for, for refining the output. That means that it works uh, on top of the network in inference time. And what will we expect for a refinement method? What will be nice to have for a particular refinement method? Okay, the first thing that will be nice to have is that the CNN return is not necessary. We have our CNN, we is already trained, and we want to make the corrections without the necessity of change anything inside the CNN. We don't want to retrain. It. We want to take the, 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 the output of the CNN as currently is and, and try to make this refinement to, to try to reduce this false positive and false negative rate. And of course, because of this, we should assume that there is no ground truth information available during the refinement process. Also, as I mentioned, in, it's, it's a, this is a, should be a post-processing step. That means that it works in inference time. And all the information that we are going to use, because we don't have anything, only the input and the CNN should come from these two points. It should come from the CNN itself and from the input volume that we are processing. And some, some, uh, uh, some outputs that we can use from the CNN are, for example, the predictions itself. We can use the current predicted values that we have. And also we can use some relationship between the, between the, the pixels or the, or the box cells in the, in the input image. We can, for example, uh, use the spatial relationship are, for example, those, those pixels close, are there separated, we can use this information to, to try to refine the, the output. And also we can use some similarity, for example, the similarity in, in the intensity. We can assume that two points that are, let's say to belong to the same organ should be more or less close in the space and also should be similar in intensity. And we can use this kind of information to, to try to do the refinement. And these are the components that conditional random fields employs to to do the refinement over the input. However, what another thing could be interesting to include apart from this, uh, that will depend on what, what else can we include, we, can we extract, sorry, can we extract from the, from the CNN? And for example, one question that we have is, can we include any information about the predictions correctness? Can we include something that tells us, okay, this uh, particular, uh, pixel might not be 
uh, cor segmenting correctly. That could be something very useful to, to drive the to refinement process. The point is how can we extract this information only from the CNN and, the, and their inputs? Um, this is, an, again, a recapitulation of what we mentioned before. Uh, CRF is constructed based on the CNN predictions and consider intensity similarities and, and spatial similarities. However, some elements of the prediction could be incorrect. We, the thing is that we don't know which one. Uh, um, this is the only information that we have available, uh, as we mentioned before. We have the input, we have the pre-trained model, we, we know the, the model. So we can uh, do whatever we want with the current state of the model, and also we have the prediction. And the, and the question is, how can we estimate the correctness of the CNN prediction? And here is when uncertainty uh, came into the scenario. Uh, we have some, we have the work for, from Jaren Gal that shows that uh, we can approximate or we can use a CNN models that were trained with dropout layers after every conversion network. We can use this kind of model to estimate the uncertainty of the prediction of one particular CNN. That's basically because this is training a, a CNN in this way is a mathematical equivalent to approximating a Bayesian model so having a, having a probabilistic model allows us to, to, to obtain some information about the confidence or uh, say in another way about the uncertainty of the network. Also, we have some works that have shown that the uncertainty regions uh, have the potential to bring highlights about the quality and potential errors in the segmentation results. And that's the thing that is interesting for us because we want something that tells, okay, this pixel might be wrong and we need to to take this into account for the refinement process. And also another nice point about the proposal of Yaringal is that the Monte Carlo anthropologist, as they call to their, to their method, um, can estimate the uncertainty of the network without retraining or without any modification to the network. So that's something good that we would like to have in our refinement process. We want a method that make uh, no modifications um, to, the, to, the, to the architecture of the network or, or make no training, no retraining of the network. So that's a good method to use to include in the, in this, in the segmentation process. So in conclusion from this part, we can employ the uncertainty of the model to highlight potentially correct and incorrect points. We can take the uncertainty as a measurement of how how good or how sure is the network about the correctness of the predictions? The point is, how can we use this uncertainty uh, in the internal final? We, we, we know how information about correctness, and now how we can include this information in the internal refinement process. OK. And, the, and what we have proposed to include this information is using a graph representation of data. Let me briefly explain this part here. We can use the uncertainty estimation to split the predictions of the CNN. We can grow the predictions into confident predictions and unconfident predictions. Uh, combining this with a graph representation of the data, we can end with a partial label graph. For example, we have some input slices. So we have something happening inside a process. Uh, let, let's say it's a black box for the moment. I will go into details later. But we have something uh, happen uh, in the inside. We have one uncertain analysis process that brings some information about high confidence, low and low and uncertain elements. And then taking this and bringing or representing the input data as a graph, as a graph, um, we can end with this kind of um, 
structure here. When we have the graph, the nodes, we have some connection between the between the the nodes. But the point here is that we have some elements that have high confidence. For example, these green elements are high confidence positive predictions. The negative elements are high confidence negative predictions. Sorry, the red elements are high confidence negative predictions. And also we have the uncertain ones. And from this, we can say that we are not sure about the label. We can consider this as unlabeled nodes in, in this graph representation. So what we have here is a partially labeled graph where the objective here is to try to, to learn a model over this graph using only the high confidence elements and then propagate information to the, from this learned model to the low confidence point. And currently we have also different works working in this direction. For example, we have the work of Thomas Kiff that propose uh, one semester supervised graph conversion neural networks or GCN for short, that, um, that can actually train only on the label part of the data. So the general idea to recapitulate are is train the graph, sorry, train the GCN model, this graph network using high confidence predictions that, that will be the, the green and red points in this example. And then use the train GCN to refine the segmentation. Use this train GCN and predict the labels of this graph. That would be the general idea of the, of the process. So let's go to each point in detail. What we are proposing is a two-step refinement process for the single organ probably in CT volumes. The first step is composed by the uncertainty analysis. We have some outputs for the uncertainty analysis. We have um, the uncertainty itself. We have one volume that we call the expectation. We have also the original input volume to, to have also some information about the, the intensities. We have also the prediction of it coming from the CNN. In this part, what we are, what we obtain is that first we find the high uncertainty and low uncertainty predictions. And then we make the assumption that high uncertainty could be potentially incorrect. And so we cannot use during the training of a graph. That could be the first, um, the first point of our methodology. The second step is the refinement itself is taking this information and represent the data using these inputs, represent the data in a, in a graph light way, like way. So this part in is composes the, or contains the graph definition. We need to, we need a methodology to, to obtain this partial label graph. And once we have the graph, we go for the uh, semi supervised GCN training that will give us the, a model that that we will finally use to evaluate the, this partial level graph and obtain the final, the output of the train GCN model as the refined segmentation. And the last step will be uh, taking this graph representation of the data and going back to the, let's say to the spatial, to the image representation. And uh, we showed that uh, the, the framework that we are proposing can increase the average dice score by one and 2% uh, for pancreas and split segmentation uh, models respectively. So let's go a little bit more in detail to each of these steps. Let's go first with the uncertainty analysis. Okay, so let's assume that we have a CNN model defined by, by G that takes one input, one input slice or one input volume with parameters theta. And then we obtain a predicted segmentation Y of, out of this model. And each X represents um, 
one point element of this input volume or input image. If we are working with images, each X could represent one particular pixel inside the image. If we are working, for example, with three data, that could be one voxel inside the image. And using the Monte Carlo drop box strategy, uh, what we what Monte Carlo drop box does is that they apply the drop of layers in inference time uh, to to obtain one sample from this uh, approximation to the to this probabilistic model, and then re they repeat this process two different times in a way that they apply or they evaluate the model using dropout uh, t times and then, and then they get two different uh, samples of the different predictions. Uh, because we are applying dropout layers, the prediction might change slightly. So at the, at the end, we take the average of these two different samples uh, taken from the from the model using drop of layers, and we call this the expectation of the of this of the model for one particular input. We are working only with one particular input volume, and this expectation is related only to that particular input image or input volume. Once we have this expectation. We can obtain uncertainty based on the model entropy. We are using the entropy of the model as an indicator of uncertainty. The entropy is defined in this way. We take the, the probability of x, and multiply for the, for the logarithm of the same probability, and we do this for, for each class. In the binary segmentation uh, case, we have c equal to 2. Taking this, uh, taking this formula, we will obtain an uh, uncertainty map, an image that highlights the elements that are more or are less, uh, where the model has more or has less confidence regarding the predictions. Uh, as we can see here, we can some examples of this uncertainty analysis process. Uh, we have the input slice. Uh, this is just as reference, this is the ground truth. We have the model prediction. And then we have here the two components used uh, or obtained during the uncertainty analysis process. We have first expectation taken from one for this particular input slice. And then we, can, we have here the uncertainty that correspond also to this particular input slice. Uh, in this image here, I hope you can see my the, my cursor. And in this image, in the uncertainty image here, the bright, uh, the high intensity or, or the brighter regions indicate high uncertainty areas. As you can see, if we compare, for example, the model segmentation with the with the model's predictions, we can see that the uncertainty is already highlighting some elements that could be actually incorrect in the uh, when we compare the model prediction with the model segmentation. So this is something something uh, good. It's a property I would like to, to use to, to have these indicators about what is wrong in the model prediction. OK, so we need this uh, uncertainty map. Now the next step is that we need to define the potential misclassified candidates. We need to to see which of these, or to, or to choose which of these points in the predictions are potentially incorrect. And the way uh, we are doing this is used by binarizing the uncertainty map using one threshold. So we, we obtain a binarized uncertainty just by taking the threshold of the uncertainty map obtained obtain, obtain it before. And what this uh, binary uncertainty map is telling, is telling us this is indicating which points in the image have a high uncertainty. Okay, so now we have all of these components here. We have the 
the, the input and the prediction, we have computed the expectation, and also we have the uncertainty. We have the uncertainty map, and also we have the, the binarized uncertainty for this particular input. The next step is, uh, is the graph um, refinement process that includes taking this information and formulate for the problem as a graph learning problem. So we have something in this, with this form. Uh, we have one particular graph model that takes as the input one graph representation of the input data. The graph representation is constructed using these models that we have, sorry, these volumes that we have here. And also the graph have some train parameters theta. And at the end, the uncertainty is obtained uh, by evaluating this graph representation of the data on this model. And then we have, we have this y, y star that represent uh, the refined segmentation taken from the graph. Okay, so let's take a look of the graph construction process. Uh, the first thing we need to do is we need labels. Uh, we need nodes. The node part is easy. We can consider each point in the image or each box cell in the volume. Uh, we can consider those as the nodes of the graph. So we are constructing a graph over the, over the box cells or pixels in the image. The next thing we need to do is we need to assign, assign one label to these nodes for the elements that have uh, low uncertainty. And of course, for the elements, and also we need to choose which elements will be considered as unlabeled in for the refinement for the graph learning problem. And for that, we use this rule here that they into account the binarized uncertainty map. If we have this uh, binary uncertainty map equal to zero, that means that that particular input, that particular point in the input image, it has a low uncertainty or equivalent. It has a high confidence. In that case, we would like to use this as a label for our, for our graph. So we just keep the prediction of the CNM. Uh, if the binary uncertainty map is equal to one, that means that this particular point has a high uncertainty. And then we consider this as unlabeled inside the, inside the graph. The next point is that we need to define the connectivity. And we need also to define some waiting strategy for these connections. We have the nodes. We know which nodes uh, will, take, will have labels. We know which, which nodes are unlabeled. The next point is how do we connect this node, these nodes? And we try with this uh, connectivity strategy. Uh, we first, for example, imagine that the, the dark node here is the is the central node that we want to connect to other to other to the other points in the, in the graph. So this particular node will be first connected to to the six perpendicular neighbors. Uh, if we are working, we would like, for example, in this case, to work in with the entire volume. So we can consider the neighbors inside the same slide. For example, the slide here, the, the slide I here, uh, we are taking the up, bottom, left, and, and right neighbors from the particular node. And also, we are considering the corresponding of the neighbor nodes uh, that are perpendicular in the previous and in the next slice. So we are generating these connections, these local connections between adjacent boxes in the adjacent boxes of this particular uh, node or this particular voxel. However, one problem with this 
only connectivity connectivity strategy is that it only considers local information. We, we don't know nothing about uh, long what's happening, for example, in long range connection. We have no information about maybe similar points uh, to this node that are maybe uh, a little bit far away from this. Maybe, maybe they belong to the same organ, but they are not in immediate networks. They are not in, in this local neighborhood. That's one problem. And another problem, problem that this particular strategy could give is that I will go back to the to this figure here. If you can see here, the uncertainty generate regions of connect of connected components or connected pixels. If we consider only local neighborhood, we can end with connections that contains only uncertain elements. And that's something that maybe might not be ideal for, for the strategy. We will also to include for every node some connections from, from low uncertainty points. So we can take a look to, to connection with, with uh, low uncertainty, but also with connections, sorry, the connection to high uncertainty, but also we want to use, so we want to take a look to those elements that have high confidence to do this propagation. Uh, to, to propagate information from, from this high confidence point. So in, in order to, to bring this information from long range information and also to, to include information coming from, from high confidence elements, we decided to, to include K different random nodes coming from inside the, from inside the, uh, the anatomy, from inside the anatomy of interest. Uh, how can we, for doing this, uh, we first define a region of interest using the uncertainty map and also using the prediction of the network. Having this information, the predictions and the uncertainty, we can define a region of interest that surround the organ. And then these K random, random nodes are taken inside this small region of interest. In this way, we ensure that we have local information and also we have some connections coming from, uh, from some, some long range information given by these connections coming from, from non-local non and non-local neighborhood. And also these random connections, we are hoping that this could also bring information not only from, from uh, low confidence, but also will bring information for high confidence points. Once we have the connections, we also, it's ideal to have a way to, to wait to these, these connections to, to keep some kind of importance to some connection over, over the others. And the way we, are, we do this is we employ a waiting function composed by the similarity in expectation, intensity, and in position. The similarity in expectation is given by the diversity. It's defined by this equation here. It is telling us it's take to particular points we are taking the expectation of the particular nodes in the, in the graph. And we're computing this formula. This formula is basically telling us how different are this, the, the value of the expectation of these two particular nodes. To this information, we are also adding a similarity in intensity and, and position that this is something that is uh, commonly used to, to include this similar information. We have two exponential functions, two Gaussian kernels, one taking into account the intensity distribution of the, of the input volumes, the intensity of the, of the input, and the other taking into account the difference in the in distance in the, the spatial position of the of the, of the particular voxels inside the volume, and this uh, this compose the the weighting is the weighting function for the edge the edges of our graph. So the last step is going to the refinement itself. Now we have a partial label graph 
um, that we can then use to train this graph learning model. Uh, we can, if we have, for example, we can use, for example, the work of Thomas Kiff directly. This is uh, specific, specifically a proposed to working with this partial labeled graph. And this is the basic definition of the of a two-layered graph convolution neural network. We have one normalized adjacency matrix defined by these formulas here. And uh, we have uh, the adjacency matrix that it basically tells us how is what are the neighbors or how is the connection for one particular node. We have the input feature matrix X that in this case, for the features, we are using the values of the, of the intensity, the entropy, and the, and the expectation. Um, and also we have the, the parameters of the convolutional filter in the graph domain. We have W1 and W0 for a two-layered graph convolutional network. And this D here represents the degree matrix that is just the it's, it's just the addition of the, it's a diagonal matrix that where each element of the diagonal is computed by the sum over the rows of the adjacency matrix. It's telling us how dense is the connectivity for a particular node in the, in the, in the, in the, in the graph. So the process is, is simple. It, it's a, this is a standard, um, GCN learning process, we have the graph, we have the GCN. We employ, for example, the cross entropy loss function to, to train this graph. And after T level T iterations, we stop the training process. And then we take the or graph representation of the data and we evaluate the graph in this GCN. And then we take those predictions as the refinement output for this particular volume. Now let's go for some of the implementation details to, to go to the, to the experimental part. Um, we have um, a CNN, a two-dimensional CNN, train on access slices. To obtain a volume from this 2D CNN, what we did is we just predict all the slices individually and then we stack the slices together to obtain one volumetric prediction with a two-dimensional unit. And to refine the CNN outputs, uh, the, we perform the uncertain analysis. And a GCN is trained for each individual input volume. And this works on a volume level. That means that we perform this process for every volume that we want to to refine. The uncertainty analysis use Monte Carlo dropout with a dropout rate of 3. And we use 20 samples to, to compute the expectation. The GCN model is a two layer neural network with theory two feature maps in the hidden layer. And because we are working in with binary organ segmentation, in this case, we have one single output form that telling us which, what is the the final class organ or background. The UCN was trained for 200 epochs with a learning rate of one to the exponential minus two. And we use the binary cross entropy loss function with the other optimizer. We compare the results with a conditional random fields refinement process. And we test the approach with two problems. One, the pancreas segmentation refinement for this, we use the NIH dataset. We employ 45 CT volumes for training the CNN. Once we train the CNN, these volumes were no longer used. And then we go for 20 volumes for the refinement, for testing the refinement. That means that we predict these 20 volumes and then we apply the refinement methods to, to try to improve the segmentation. Also, we try with a split dataset from the medical image segmentation decathlon. And in this case, we employ 26 city volumes for training the CNN. 
Again, once the CNN is trained, we didn't use, again, these 26 CT volumes. Uh, then we go for the refinement strategy of nine CT volumes. And the, the same process, we compute the, uh, the CNN output from these nine CT volumes, and then we refine and that output using the refinement strategies. And these are the initial results. We have here what is the initial dice score of the CNN of the distal dimensional unit over the input volumes. We have the, the results of the condition random fields based refinement strategy. And finally, we have the GCN based refinement method here at the end. As you can see, we have a slight improvement with the pancreas segmentation problem over the conditional random field strategy. And for the spleen problem, we have uh, around two points of improvement compared with the conditional random field refinement strategy in this particular case. We also try the refinement of the GCN refinement method, employing different values for this uncertainty threshold. Uh, this uncertainty threshold, as you remember, is the one that we use to split uh, to the, 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 the prediction of the CNN as high or low uncertainty. So this will affect the number of, for example, will affect the number of of sample that we have to train. We, we also increase the number of points that we are going to use in the graph. So this will, this can have, for example, an impact in the computational, in the computational efficiency of the methodology. Since having uh, a lot of uncertainty points might increase the number of nodes in the graph, right? but having few amount of uncertainty points might also uh, include some bad qualities elements in the during the graph and training process. Uh, as you can see, when we run the refinement process over different values of the CNN, sorry, over different values of the threshold, we can see a slightly difference, but maybe not that big between different uncertainty thresholds. In some point, this is beneficial because that means that we can choose, for example, and a certain threshold of 0 0.5 to have a balance between the amount of, uh, of uncertainty points, low and high uncertainty points used, used to train the graph. And also we have a balance between the number of nodes that will be included in the, in the, in the graph regression problem. So we can, for example, when we have a model trained, I want to say now a model trained with sufficient data, we can use, for example, tau equal to. 2.5 as a threshold. So another thing that we, we, we test, and that's the reason I, I mentioned a model train with sufficient data, because we also train uh, what will happen, for example, if we use a model that was trained with only few uh, amount of training data. Uh, theoretically, this should um, have some variation in uncertainty because now the model is, is not observing as many examples as it should. So they should uh, more or less affect the performance, maybe increase the certainty of the, of the model because of this uh, low training data strategy. So we, we, we train again only using 10, 10 examples from the, from the, or from the pancreas that set from the original um, training that said we use randomly sample 10 and train again the CNN. And the same from the spleen for the original training set of the spleen, we sample only nine volumes and train again in a slice wise way, the two dimensional unit. And you can see we have a drop in the performance and also an increase, an increment in the variance that could be for, uh, as a result of training with low, low amount of data. We again performed the conditional random field refinement method. Now to this, to the output of this particular volume. And also we, we, we try our, our GCN refinement strategy 
also to the to the in this low uh, low training data version of the to the unit. As you can see, we again have a better performance compared to the condition random fields, and now the the difference are a little bit more notorious between the condition random field and the GCN refinement strategy. That could be because this refinement strategy considers also uncertainty information inside the in the formulation. So in this high uncertainty uh, scenario, this GCN based uncertainty GCN based strategy could be beneficial. These are some examples of visual results for the segmentation process. In the top row, we have the CNN predictions. In the bottom row, we have the GCN refinement, the output from the GCN refinement. And we have some true positives indicated in green, some false negative indicated in white, and some false positive indicated in red. As you can see, for example, in this first column, when we compare the original CNN prediction and the refinement output, we can already see that the GCN refinement strategy was able to recover these uh, false negative points and also was able to, to remove these false positive regions generated by the CNN prediction. A similar thing happened with these two second columns, where we can also see a similar pattern here. We are recovering points that were not originally segmented, and also we are eliminated false positive regions generated during the CNN predictions. But also, as we can see in this last point, this is one example when the network could, um, could um, fail, because, for example, here we have that the CNN, sorry, the GCN refinement strategy could nicely recover this um, missed region here. But also we have some false positives that were generated during using refinement method, as you can see. So this is an indication that there is uh, there is a still way to improvement for this initial proposal for GCN in, in refinement, for refinement, for segmentation refinement. This also these are also some visual results for split segmentation tasks. We can see more or less a similar pattern. We have some false negative regions in the original CNN prediction that were recovered by the GCN refinement point in these three particular slices. And this last one is also another example when the GCN refinement could, could generate some false positive regions. We can, again, we can see that we have recovered some false negative in the spleen, but also the GCN generate a small area of false positives here. Okay, so to see from where these regions could come, we can, for example, take a look to the intermediate outputs of the process. And uh, we can see the CN output, we can see the expectation from this particular prediction, we can see the entropy, and we can see the GCM refinement. As you can see, these two uh, components are, these two outputs here are components of the, of the graph formulation and also are used for the weighting or weighting the, the, the edges of, of the graph. And we can see this uh, small area of false positives comes from this uh, expectation. And this is area expectation is showing, showing here. This could be, for example, maybe a result of using expectation inside the inside the, the edge weighting, um, the edge weighting function. However, we can also see that the graph um, is also keep maintained, let's say, a, a low amount of false uh, positive generator. We could, for example, the graph could, for example, consider all this region as as a false positive, but instead of that, it keeps uh, only a small portion of this region in the uh, in the in the final result. That could be also some benefit of having these connections between different between different nodes and the, this different information coming from different nodes. 
local and, and long range information between different nodes in the, in, the, in the region of interest. We also were curious about how the expectation compares with our using refinement. And we compare, we compute the relative improvement between the GCN refinement, when we use, for example, the expectation, use taking the expectation and thresholding by a threshold of 0 0.5. We compare this between the model for the pancreas trained with full data and also between the model of the pancreas trained with only 10 volumes with this low regimen data. As we can see, in this case, we are more or less uh, around this, the, the red line that the red line um, um, shows when the GCN is, is equal to the expectation. In this case, when the model is, is trained with a, with a good amount of data, we can see that we have improvement at some points, but also we can see that the expectation could be already good when we are working with uh, with, a, with a network that was trained with a good amount of data. But for, when we take a look to, to this second graph, when the model was trained with only 10, 10 elements, 10, 10 volume samples, we can see that there is more points where the GCN actually gives a better performance, for example, when comparing the uncertainty. That could mean that when we are working with this low uh, amount of data and the the expectation might not be as re reliable as we're, when we are using a high amount of data. In this case, the, informa the information coming from the certainty could be a good, a good, for example, choice to to drive this reform strategy. And, and in these high uncertainty scenarios, this can suggest that the GCM strategy could be a good way to address this kind of high uncertainty scenarios. Also, uh, we evaluate the performance of the weighting function. As I mentioned in the methodology, for the, one of the components of the weighting function is the, the diversity that I am just writing again the formula here. We are computing the diversity between two points in the volume. Um, this is the this is the the function that we use to, to compute the to in the, the compute the refinement of the from our previous experiments. But additionally, we also compare uh, two different versions of the of the diversity. We compare a normalized version of this diversity function. And also we compare an inverse version of this diversity function. So what is the normalized version? Something about happened with this diversity is that it the lower bound is zero. We can have a value of zero, but the upper bound is there is no upper bound in this between these two different elements. Uh, so we we asked about we were curious about and trying this particular version of the diversity, that what this formula does is that it uh, normalizes the diversity instead of having something between zero and no upper bound, uh, ideally between zero and infinity. We have something that behaves similar to the diversity, but uh, where we have an uh, upper bound of one, something that's between zero and one. Um, so we try with this uh, normalized version. And for the inverse diversity, uh, the diversity, as I mentioned, it is tells you how different are the are two different um, the expectation of two different points. It's more like a dissimil dissimilarity measurement. Uh, if we take the normalized version, sorry, if we take the inverse version of the diversity, this equation here, what we get is a similar metric between the expectation of two nodes. Instead of having high values for, for points that have different expectation, this will give us high values for points that have a similar expectation. 
So they let we also try with this uh, with this um, waiting waiting function. And summarizing, we have these three different waiting. Uh, for this experiment, we did not consider the Gaussian kernels. We use only considering the, the diversity as a waiting function. And we have the original implementation that telling tell us how different are two different are two expectations between two points. The normalized diversity that we will expect to behave similar to this one is also the behavior should be similar to this. The difference is that this normalized diversity should output something between zero and one. And finally, we have the, um, the, the inverse of the diversity that this is more like a similarity metric. It's like taking into account or, or giving more importance to two components that are similar in expectation. And the results are this one here. We have for both problems for the pancreas and the spleen, and also we have for the model train with the full data set and also on the small uh, training data set. So let's take a look to the results. Uh, we have here the diversity and results obtained from the using only this as a formula, we still having improvement compared with the two-dimensional unit. And also we have here the normalized diversity and the inverse diversity. And when we compare, for example, this diversity here with a normalized version, even though this could or we expect to behave in a similar way, actually the results are pretty different. There is a lower, there is a lower performance with it when we use the normalized diversity as, as a weighting function is lower than the refinement obtained when using the only the vanilla diversity. And also is even lower than using the 2D unit. That means that we are actually losing some performance when we use this normalized version of the diversity. For the spleen, okay, we, we still have some improvement here, but the improvement is also smaller compared with using the, the, the normal diversity. That's something that we, we've seen interesting because we were expecting this to more or less have the same results or similar results because this is just the normalized version of this one here. Well, that's what we were expecting. Uh, and we, we go, for example, to the inverse of the divergent, oh, sorry, of the diversity that this is more like a similarity metric between the expectations. And uh, we can see that more or less we have where the pancreas trained on the, on the full data set, we have more or less a similar performance. And with the pancreas trained with a small data set, we have some kind of uh, not, not as good performance as using only the diversity. We have uh, a small, actually, yeah, Basically, no difference between the to the unit and the, in, and the inverse of the diversity. Um, for the spin, we have something uh, more or less similar. We have a slightly lower performance with spin. We use the inverse of the diversity, but more or less similar. And also, when we have the spin train on the low data regimen, we can see also that there is no variations in the performance between the diversity on the indie and the inverse of the diversity. So to try to, to understand what, what's happening, especially with these two weighting functions, uh, we can take a look to how each function is weighting the pairs of nodes. So let's take a look to this example. We have a one, we can have here five different nodes. We have the expectation indicated inside the circle. And we have the weighting that was assigned by each, by each uh, weighting function. So let's take a look to the diversity first. As we can see here, the diversity is doing what we were expecting, where we have a different 
expectations, the diversity is assigning a high weight. For example, in this case, when you have a completely different, uh, completely different expectation, we have one of the highest weight. And also when we have something that is not, maybe not that deep, that is also zero and something close to one, we also have a high weight. So that means that these two particular components are taken into account when learning, are taken into more account when we are training the graph. When we have elements that have similar expectation, we can see that a perfect match will be weighted by zero, by the diversity. And something that maybe is not a perfect match, but are more or less uh, similar, for example, like an expectation of zero and an expectation of 0 0.3, we will have a small weighting, at least compared with these two connections here. OK, so let's skip for the moment this uh, normalized diversity, and let's take a look to the inverse of the diversity. So for you, uh, in the inverse of the diversity, we can see the opposite behavior as expected. For elements that are different, for example, we have zero expectation zero and expectation one. This is assigned a weight of zero. Similar for, for these two nodes here. For elements that are exactly the same, we have a weighting of one. We have the, the biggest weight possible with this version of the of the diversity, oh, sorry. And for this particular node that they are maybe, um, they are close, but maybe not that similar. We, we still have in some weight, but it's a very, very, very small way, small way. They are actually not so, not so different, but this inverse diversity apparently is so strict. So it will assign a high weight only to elements that are really, really, really close in the, with similar expectation. So for this particular point here, for instance, there is not uh, close enough to be given a high weight by the inverse diversity. Now take a look to the, to the normalized diversity. What we can see here is something, uh, is something that could explain why we have a low performance with this particular function. We have that for similar, we are expecting this to behave more or less similar to the diversity with the difference that the upper bound for this will be one. However, as we can see, we have different expectation. We have a weight of one, okay, that's what's expected. We have also zero and something close to one. Okay, we have a weight in a one, that was also expected. However, let's take a look to this particular connection here. They are not so different. Um, for example, while the diversity is assigning a low weight to this connection, the normalized diversity is assigning a weight close one. That is not good for the training process because we are having some inconsistent connections. We are selling, we are telling to the to the to the model that these two elements have as much important as this one, and there is some ambiguity here. So, what should we take more into account here? Different elements or elements that may be more or less similar. And we are thinking that this could be the reason because this particular version of the diversity might not work so so well because at the end we are generating inconsistent weights between elements that are not similar and elements that are more or less slightly similar. So this could maybe introduce some noisy connection, noisy samples in the training process that at the, that at the end make the graph to, to learn uh, not so representative features. And also if we, for example, plot these three functions, we can also see some of the same conclusions. For example, if we take one fixed point P equal to zero, and then we plot in function of the difference of the first and the second values, when the second value range from zero to one, we will have different um, different values from the from the from the expectation of P one and P two going from 
something that is similar when P1 is equal to zero and P2 is equal to zero to something completely different when P1 is zero and P2 reach the one, the part of one. As we can see here, the diversity will start weighting with very, very high. It has a almost exponential growth here. So the elements that have that are different will have a very, very, very high weight weighting compared with the rest of the points. Something similar happened to the inverse of the diversity. When we have elements that are close or are similar, the difference between their, their expectation is small, will have a very high, high weighting factor that start to, to decrease exponentially when we increase the difference between two particular, between the expectation of these two particular points. However, in the normalized diversity, we can see that we reach a value of one fast. This is a, it has an exponential growth at the beginning in a way that elements that maybe are, uh, I mean, this should be behave more or less like this. However, with this function, with this graph, we can see that elements that maybe are not so different enough, enough will reach a high weighting value and will assign weight that are similar to the elements that are completely different. And that's the particular behavior of this function that might be not ideal for using as a weighting function for, for, the, for the graph, while the, the diversity appears to be more appropriate for this particular problem. Okay, to conclude uh, this presentation, uh, we have presented a method uh, to define a partially labeled graph based on uncertain information from there, coming from the CNN. We also have shown one application of GCN in the segmentation refinement tasks. We have also presented a work that is modular, and that means that uh, it's not actually dependent of the GCN use or the uncertainty strategy uh, employed. We can, for example, use a different uncertainty analysis strategy to get the expectation, to get the uncertainty estimations, and also we could use a different, uh, a different graph learning approach to obtain the final or find. And we have also evaluated the, the diversity as a weight function for the edges. And finally, future, res future research can focus on different weighting schemes. Maybe it will be more beneficial to try to incorporate attention instead of, of a predefined weighting function. That's something interesting that could uh, cool, it could be nice to try. And we can also try different connectivity me mechanism, maybe something more complex that could maybe include some prior information about the anatomy that you want to segment that could be some, something also interest, an interesting direction for this particular approach. That could be all for my site. Thanks a lot and I am open to your questions. Yeah, thank you very much for the presentation. I have some applause for you. Yeah. I hope you can hear it. Yeah. <laughs> so I have a couple of questions here in the chat. Um, the first one is, uh, it, how often do you train the graph convolutional neural network? So did you train that for every image anew? Is, did I get that right? Yes, that's correct. This is a refinement strategy that works on inference time. This means you have to train it uh, for every new data set, but just yes, on a single exactly. data set. And how, yes, how, exactly. How long does it approximately take? For, for training the particular models is around between 30, no, between two seconds, three seconds, I would say. It, it will depend on the size of the anatomy also and in the, on the number of nodes in the, in the graph. Mm -hmm. But it's in the range of seconds. It's a far yes, I think between, it depends, around 30 seconds, I would say. Okay, cool. That's, that's nice that you can actually train uh, GCN essentially during the inference time. That's pretty cool. So how, how large yeah. is the... 
how large is the effect of the um, random long range connections that you introduce in the in the GCN? The GCN, um, we try, for example, without uh, without using this random connection. We use, for example, a full twenty six neighborhood local neighborhood, and when the model is trained with with very with a good number of examples, there is improvement, but it's only a slightly slightly improvement. But however, the difference can be noted when we use when we train a model with few examples where the uncertainty is, is bigger. In this case, the difference between using only the local connectivity and incorporating also a different number of, of random connections. Uh, that's the difference is could be noted here. Yeah, 16, 18, we use 16 because I, we thought that that would be a good number, for example, a balance between the number of nodes because each connection that we add will increase the the amount of uh, space required to represent mm -hmm. the graph in, in memory. So going higher for 16 might lead to some memory issues when we are trying to represent the, the graph in memory. And say if you have a, a regular, like the six neighborhood that you have for the per, uh, perpendicular neighbors, uh, could you then also implement the graph convolution network with a CNN? If you have a just regular it's also possible to Just it's also possible because at the end you have a graph representation. It's only representing local information, but you have all the components to define a graph. <laughs> Then, um, yeah, so th there's a question about the weighting function in the graph, and you very extensively reported um, on the, uh, how do you call it, the, the um, where you use the, the diversity. The diversity, exactly. So you reported very extensively about the diversity, but how important are the other two parts, the uh, position and the actual value? They are important and yes, they are important when we compare, for example, um, the, when we use a different version of the diversity, they will change the importance. I could say that uh, the best combinations, there is there is extensive also analysis in the, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the paper, in, in the middle of the paper. But for example, when, when we use the diversity together with the Gaussian kernels, because the diversity, as you can see, uh, gives very high weights. <laughs> there is more weight to the diversity. And when we have elements with different expectation. <laughs> However, when we have elements that have a similar expectation, the diversity is, is ideally close to zero. In, in that particular scenario, uh, the, the the connections or the importance of the connection are given by the similarity in the weighting and in the mm -hmm. and in the space. Something interesting is that using the normalizer of the diversity uh, leads also to to even worse results. And also there's an analysis in the paper about that. The point is that the normalizer of the diversity also when we use this the similarity metric between zero and one. It enters in conflict with the, with the similarity metric between zero and one of, of the two Gaussian kernels. I see. And this will and this will also harm the training of the GCN at the end. Mm -hmm. And you are comparing to essentially a conditional uh, Markov random fields in the inference. Did you think about comparing it also to other? approaches that are very commonly used in connected components like agglomerative clustering or something like that? Um, we have not tried with uh, testing component with those, with those uh, approaches, or it might be also interesting to <laughs> compare for the moment. We went for conditional random fields because that what we've seen was commonly used for, for example, in some supervised learning approaches of refinement. Yeah, and they can yeah, also be implemented into a, a deep neural network. So that's also a big advantage of them. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, thank you very much yeah. for the presentation. I do have another round of applause for you. <laughs> Thanks, a lot. Thanks a lot for the invitation. Yeah, so thank you very much for coming. And this 
already concludes our session. Yeah, you've seen there was a vivid discussion after the presentation. And of course, the discussion doesn't have to end with the presentation here in this video. Obviously, you can contact us. So you can either leave comments, you can contact us on social media. And I will forward your question to Roger if you have any, and we would be very glad to answer them. So I hope you enjoyed this presentation as much as I did, and I'm very much looking forward to seeing you in the next video of Beyond the Patterns. <laughs>